Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is love. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have a Hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We are indeed blessed that you can join us, that we can join with you wherever you might happen to be. We're blessed to have this technology that we can use to reach around the world with the Word of God. So, we're continuing on in our study of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. We're in the 13th week this week, uh, and we'll pick it up in chapter 4, starting at verse 14. Uh, but before we do, let's start with a prayer. Mark, want to lead us in a prayer? Oh, oh Lord, we thank you for being here tonight. And just be with us to guide us through and show us what we need to see and hear to incorporate in our lives to tell others about you. Amen. 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 We're also blessed to have Brother Blaze back joining us. It's been a while since he's been here. Uh, and like I said, all of you. So, hi, all of you. If you haven't been with us in the in the previous studies, they are available here on demand online at the Bible Talk website. Uh, so you can go back and review anything. You can invite others to participate, and they can catch up or see any of the the Bible studies. Uh, this, as I said, is the thirteenth. I, I use the word chapter because it's our thirteenth week. Uh, and it's been a real blessing. The Word of God is always a blessing. So we left off last week in the 13th chapter. We finished up in the 13th chapter of chapter 4, talking about hope. You know, Paul had said that, talking about, we talked last week about life and death and eternity, talking about how we don't have to grieve. 13th verse. Oh, I'm sorry. You said we finished off in the 13th chapter. Oh, no, we did not. Gosh, there's not even 13 chapters there, are there? Yeah, we'll have time looking for that. Um, okay, so the world doesn't have hope. We Christians have a hope that the world doesn't have. And that's what Paul is talking about here. All right, so I want to pick it up where, where that is, and we'll start in the 14th verse of chapter 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So we spent the, the whole entire chapter last week talking about life and death. And that being asleep is because we don't die. Christians don't die. No. We just go on to be with the Lord. So the hope that we have, I, I just wanted to mention a couple of verses because I thought this is important. In Romans 15, verse 4, Paul writes and says, For whatever was written in earlier times, he's talking about Scripture, right? Mm -hmm. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the source of our hope is the word that God has spoken, right? Because that's where his promises are. This is a book of promises from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It is the promises of God in our life. The other thing is, Paul wrote to Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and he said, "Looking, We're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. So this is the root of the hope that we have, because the world is a mess. You may not have noticed that. Mm -hmm. I'm being facetious, aren't I? Yes, you are. Because if you haven't noticed that the world is a mess, brother, you must be like, what was his name? The guy that slept for 20 years? No. Rip Van Winkle. Rip, Rip Van Winkle. You must be sound asleep wherever you are, because the world is a mess. And there is no hope in the world. All the hope that you hear is false hope. All right? Because this world is spiraling down and out of control. But we have a hope because our hope is not fixed on something down here where the mess is. Our hope is fixed on the things above. John 14 is kind of a bridge. Uh, in music, you have a bridge that links two things together. A bridge links two bodies of land together. I want to give you a scripture verse that links what Paul is talking about with life and death and saints going to sleep and the hope that we have. 
And that's this, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard this first. In John chapter 14, Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. And by the way, that verse does not end there. All right. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Watch out for people who give you half that verse. Because they're giving you a promise without their cause for it. All right. He goes on to say in verse 2, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this is the, that's the words of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to have a peace that only he can give, a peace that passes understanding, a peace that the world can't give, is what Scripture says. Mm -hmm. But it comes from this, that we don't have to ever be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Because he has made a promise that he has gone to prepare a place for us and he'll come back and get us. And that's the bridge here in 1 Thessalonians where Paul is talking about this hope that we have. And now we go on and he starts talking about that second, that glorious second coming of the Lord. About Jesus Christ, right? Coming back. He's coming back. Now, um, I want to read this verse because this is key to what we're going to talk about tonight. This is from 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, when he talks about sleep here, and this is what we covered last week, he's talking about what the world calls death, right? And he's saying, we're not all going to die. Well, the scripture says that it's appointed unto man to die once. Everybody dies. The world says there's two things that are certain. Death and taxes. Well, they can commit me for taxes, but you want to know something? You already died. I already did the death part. Yeah. It wasn't so bad. I, so that's gone. That's past. The only thing I can do now is fall asleep. I can go to be with the Lord. But there's something other than that, and this is the mystery he's talking about. There's an alternative to me going to be with the Lord. And the alternative is the Lord coming to get me. And oh, taking me away. Yeah. Okay. That's the alternative. And that's where Paul is going in this letter now. And that's what people call the rapture. And that is what, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the rapture. All right. So let, let me read now from verse four, from 15 to 18 here in chapter 4. So Paul writes and he says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as Alice just said, that's what's commonly called the rapture. A term that I'm sure... Everybody out there is pretty much familiar with. Mm -hmm. Let's see where this comes from, right? In Matthew 24, and by the way, a few years ago, we did an entire study on that, that one chapter. I think it, was, it took us about 12 weeks to get through Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. But Matthew 24 is a time when the disciples, well, let me read this. The disciples came to Jesus privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Matthew 24 starts out by the disciples, the apostles coming to Jesus because he's talking about the end. And he's saying, okay, what, what's, how are we going to know when this is? All right. So Jesus goes on. And if you haven't read Matthew 24, you need to get in there and look at this. Because he goes on talks about false prophets, false signs, false messiahs. And, and these are the signs, famines, wars and rumors of wars and famines in diverse places. These are the signs that was coming. But then, in Matthew 24, verse 30, 37 to 42, he says this. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that, the Lord, that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. All right? So here's Jesus talking specifically about the end of time. And he talks about, without really explaining it there, but he says, it's, you know, two are going to be there, one's taken, one's left, right? So the word rapture, by the way, comes from this letter, Paul's letter, in verse 17, because in verse 17 he says, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. It's that word, the Greek word there, caught up, is where the word rapture comes from. Because actually, in the Latin Vulgate, in the 4th century, um, Jerome wrote the, what became the, the canonized Catholic Bible, written in Latin, right? And that was used for centuries and centuries and centuries. And he used the word where the Greek says caught up. He used the word, the, the Latin word, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, rapimuer. Or, this is where we get our word rape, by the way. Because back in the fourth century, rape was a woman when marauding Huns came through. And they would, they would literally carry off women, right? Yeah. They would snatch them away. And that's where the word came from. And this is where rapture, the word rapture means to be caught away. Okay? Now, if that word, that Greek word that's used there is used a number of times in, in the New Testament. And I, I wanted to share a couple of these times so you get a better understanding of what this means. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or not, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words. He's talking about himself, of course. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, he's using that same word. He was raptured. He was caught up in a way, right? Now, he didn't physically go, or who knows what happened. Right? Well, I was going to ask you, then, like in Matthew, when it talks about the one will be taken... And one will be left. Is that the same thing as being caught away? Or is that, I mean, could that mean they just fell asleep and their bodies are still there, but they were taken? Well, we're going to try and figure that out. Okay. Because that's what I said. It, you know, it doesn't specifically say that. Or, however, when Paul is talking here, and that's why I want you to see how the word is used in other places, it literally means to be taken away, all right? Removed, okay? You know the story in the book of Acts about um, Philip when he yes. ministered to the eunuch, yes. right? Let me read you that. This is from... He ordered the chariot to stop. This is when Philip meets the eunuch, right? And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, the King James there says he was caught away. Yeah. Right? So now he is literally out of sight. He's there with the eunuch, and all of a sudden, it's boom, not. the Spirit of God raptures him. It's that same Greek word. Snatches him away, and the eunuch doesn't see him. He's gone, right? This word is always used in the sense of being carried away by an outside force of power. It's not like you run away. It's not like you leave. It's something takes you, right? That's, that's important, right? Now, when Paul is talking here, remember, he said, right, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. What's the first thing there? He descends with a shout, shout. Yeah. with the voice of the archangel. Right? So this event, the rapture, is instigated or it's initiated by a calling. Mm. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Uh, let me just ask you a question. What do you think he's going to shout? Hey, hey, yo, hey, you. <laughs> I think, yeah. I, 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 think he, I think I'm going to hear him shout my name. Mm -hmm. Well, what about you? Well, I think you'll hear him shout your name. How is that possible? Because God is a God to whom nothing is impossible. And I, and I think back to... Lazarus? <coughs> well, yeah. He called Lazarus out and he called him by name. 
But how can he call, how can he shout one shout and everybody hears their own name? Well, he's God. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the, the first time that there's a kind of an event like this in the book of Acts is on the day of Pentecost. Right. Yeah, and Pentecost. they're all speaking in tongues, it says. Or, but they're not, it doesn't say that they're speaking in an unknown language. Heard it language. says, right, the people say they heard it in their language. Yeah. Not, the, not that it was spoken in their language. Mm -hmm. So God can, you know, sound is airwaves, right? Yeah. God can change the airwaves. Yes, I, I know that to be a fact. I, I tell a story, I'll tell it real quick. Um, many years ago, back in the late 70s, we had a music ministry. Uh, I, okay, we had a music ministry, and we were at a prayer meeting one time, and I guess there were like nine or ten of us in this group, right? Yeah. And we sang at the prayer meeting, and this one song we sang, it was the most horrible thing I ever heard in my life. It was like, you didn't it sounded... Hear a job. No. Um, I will graciously say it sounded like Cats having their tails pulled or something. I mean, it was it was terrible. <laughs> so when the prayer meeting was all over and done, I kind of got everybody in the prayer, the the ministry together, and I was I was really upset. I was really upset. Uh, I must have left the fruit someplace else. But I was really upset because <laughs> it was it was so bad, and I was really getting ready to kind of holler at everybody for doing such a terrible job. And just as I was, this little old lady walks up. And start saying, that was the most beautiful thing that I ever heard. That just touched my spirit. She's talking about this song that I'm about to holler at everybody for. Now, I know she heard what we didn't sing. God, God had to manipulate those sound waves between our mouths and her ear. I, I know that to be a fact. He's able to do that. But you see, it's, it's really important to understand this, how important this is. Like Lazarus, that you hear him call your name. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, right? Yes. That's where we get the word ecclesiastic. Yeah, I'm sure, you, you know, if you've been a Christian any time, you've seen the word ecclesia, ecclesiastic, or something you know, to that. Well, that's literally the Greek word that means to be called. And it comes from the fact that the, the Senate in Greece, that's, they were called, they were an assembly, and they were an ecclesia. That's before there was a church. You had the Greek Senate, and that was an ecclesia because they were called to the meetings. Okay? But did that change the people? You know, before you had everybody talking the same language, but when they were building that one thing, Tower of Babylon, Tower of Babylon, didn't God change everybody's voice? And it changed language? your language. Yes. Yeah. So, so they people couldn't communicate. communicate. Right. But God can communicate with us. Yes. Because he right. speaks to us in, in ways that the world can't and we can't with each other. Well, so what I'm saying, but it, it, we've been called, you see. It says that uh, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. So when he came to find us, to seek and save us, that's what it says in Luke 19.10. He called us by name. Yes. That's what it says in Isaiah 43, verse 1, right? Mm -hmm. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light as Paul, as Peter said, right? Mm -hmm. In First Peter. Yeah. He called us out of the domain of darkness and into his kingdom, as Paul says in Colossians in the first chapter. And out of the pit, out of the miry clay, right? Mm -hmm. Set our feet upon a rock, as David says. So when we were called into the church, we were caught out of, we were called by name, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm looking for Alice, and that has happened on occasion, I am likely to go around and say, hey, Alice, I'll call you by name. I'm not going to call you Ralph because you won't answer that. No. I'm not just going to say, hey, because everybody might answer to that or nobody would answer to that. Mm -hmm. So I call you by name. That's the one thing. That's why we don't really understand how important names are. And one of the things that is in the importance of names is it has power. It has power to capture your attention. Mm -hmm. If I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody holler, hey, Joe, I just keep on going. If I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody holler, hey, Alan, guess what? It stops me, captures my attention. That's one of the things that is the power of a name, right? So he's called us. Why has he called us for? Remember what Paul wrote. And we studied this way back in the beginning of this study. In, in chapter 1, verse 10, when he said, 
He's called us to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. What this whole thing is about is about being rescued, being saved, being redeemed from the wrath to come. Right? So there is wrath is, it's, it goes beyond anger. anger, but it goes beyond anger. All right? Wrath is... Well, it's amplified anger. It's, uh, it's not necessarily uncontrolled because wrath can be controlled. All right? Wrath to me is action. Well, it's it's the anger, it's the action of anger. But it's right. but it's it's not just being mad. I mean, it is yes. it goes beyond that. All right, wrath is responding in this this rage. Rate. Well, I, I hate to use those apply those words to God. Right? It's not discipline because discipline. Is like spanking. So if your child does something wrong, the wrath of God is not discipline. Right. It is. You don't. You don't get somebody based on rage. rage but you, it's not necessarily rage, right? Um, if you, if somebody is found guilty of first oh, degree right, murder right. and is judged to be guilty or worthy of capital punishment, and is put to death, right? Put to death, however they choose to do it. If he's hung, if he's electrocuted, if he's given a gas chamber, if he's given the, the shot with a needle. That's not discipline, because it doesn't have as its purpose correction. Right? But, it's it's also, but right. you agree with that? Mm -hmm. It's also not wrathful. Or I, maybe that is the wrath of, of society. Because that's that the is the that is the expression of the ultimate consequence of an of a bad action. Well, also you're disciplining society to tell others that this is what happens when well, you do that. No, no, so our society did no. Our society absolutely denies it. But but one of, that even though it denies it, doesn't mean that it it could be the case if it was done on a consistent basis. Okay. The, the thing that I can tell you is the wrath of God does not have as its purpose. To set an example for those, no, yeah, there's nothing left after because it's wrath, exactly. right? Yeah. The wrath okay. is the end, right. final anger. But, okay, and there is such a thing as the anger of God. Without that, there is an anger of God. Uh, by the way, and we'll get into this a little bit. Rapture cannot be separated from tribulation, the great tribulation. All right, mm -hmm. the seven years of great tribulation, and, and we'll talk about that. But those those two things go hand in hand, right? What is the wrath to come? Talking about the wrath. Paul starts his letter by talking about the purpose of Jesus Christ that we're waiting for is to rescue us, to save us from this wrath that is to come. Right? The unleashing of so, well, but that wrath to come is the great tribulation. And God's purpose is to save us from that. Right? Where is that term of wrath to come? Is that in this book? Yeah. First chapter 1, verse 10. Okay. So what is the wrath to come? Listen to this verse. This is 2 Peter 3, 7. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. All right? Destruction of ungodly men. Not their correction, not their discipline, but for their destruction. That's the end of the matter. This present world is reserved for that destruction. Okay? That's the wrath to come. Utter destruction. Peter says that this present earth is reserved for destruction by fire. Why is the wrath to come? Because of sin. Well, to Adam, he, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree from which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. The, girt, the earth, the it's ground, cursed. is cursed because of the sin of Adam. Why? Well, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Yes. We're supposed to vote, right? Yes. Proverbs 8.13 says this, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. We, we should hate evil. The problem is it's that hard. we live in such a compromised world that we have begun to tolerate sin. God will not. Sin is an abomination to God. We're supposed to have this fear of the Lord. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it says in Proverbs. Fear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it says in Proverbs. We're supposed to have the same mind, right? The, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. 
Why? Well, you know, today the, the debate re just rages about pollution, right? Okay. And people think pollution is kind of a new thing. You know, it's all, you talk to people today and they're talking about, well, you know, it's the factories, it's this. It's not. If you are a Christian, you are supposed to appraise things spiritually. You are supposed to look through the lens of Scripture at the things going on in the world. I want to tell you when pollution starts here. What I read to you from chapter 3 of Genesis, that's when pollution started. Isaiah 24, verses 3 to 6, I'm going to read. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled. For the Lord has spoken this word. Now, he watches over his word to, to perform it. You know that. So God has said, this earth is gone. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of earth fade away. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants. inhabitants. But they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth. And all those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Okay? So you see, what is the wrath? It is the utter destruction. It is his end. Why is it? Because God has to wipe out every trace of sin. Sin and evil have condemned both heaven and earth to destruction. Yes, I said heaven. Why? Because Satan's rebellion took place in heaven. So sin occurred in heaven. Therefore, in Revelation 21.1, I mean, think of the logic of the word of God. People tell me, you know, this is no logic. This, this book, every so, bit of it fits together and is totally logical. Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Why? They're destroyed. Why? Because they were polluted by transgression, by sin. You can't take sin and polish it and make it look nice. You can't clean it up. It's got to be done. That's why the wages of sin is death. It has to be completely annihilated. So that's the what is wrath. That's the why is wrath. Now the next question is, when is wrath? Because we're not talking about the flood. Oh, it'll be like the flood, except for one way. Is human history on earth after the flood. There is no human history on earth as we understand it after this. There's a new heaven and a new earth, right? When is the wrath to come? Okay, you may want to write this down. I told you, you should be taking notes, all right? But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. How, that's from Matthew 24, 36. When is it? Who knows? Only the Father. Knows. So don't, you know, please don't be deceived. Don't, how can so many Christians be deceived when some guy gets on the radio or right and says, okay, it's going to be this hour, this day. No, but when is it coming? The word of God. God's pure word says, no one knows. Only the Father. Not even the Son knows. Having said that, Jesus said this. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all of these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. That goes back to Matthew 24, talking about those signs that I mentioned. The false prophets, the false messiahs. The wars and rumors of wars, the famines in diverse places. He says, when you see all of these things happening, know that it's near, right? But you don't know what time. I said, you know, one day I was praying, and, and I just had this kind of vision. I, it's like all of a sudden I could see into the throne room of God, and there's just myriads and myriads, that means lots, of, of angels and people, the saints who have gone on before us. And, and Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the father turns to Jesus and says, get the horse. It's time. A shiver went through heaven. It's going to happen. 
That's going to happen. The father's going to turn to Jesus and say, it's time. How far off is that? Well, I just got through saying nobody knows. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know. However, That's learn science. the parable from the fig tree. There are signs that we should give us, give us a signal that the time is approaching, that it's near. Therefore, it says, going on in Matthew 24, be on the alert, for you don't know which day the Lord is coming. So, we don't know what time, but we won't need to be on the alert. For, for one thing, we're going to talk about the rapture, we're going to talk about the, the tribulation, and that's the end of time, you know, when's Jesus going to come back, am I going to be prepared? You know what? You have no guarantee that you're going to make it to tomorrow. None, none so ever. Now, I, I mean, I can tell you this from experience, that things can happen in your life, boom, in a snap. that can change everything in an instant. Yes. No time for preparation. You know, I got hit by a truck in Central America. I didn't get, I didn't have, yeah, I had warning. I had about a two-second warning. Enough time for me to turn and jump, which, praise God, I was able to do. That's not a lot of warning. All of a sudden, your entire life is going to be changed. Here, we have signs. What are the signs? Go back. The fig tree. Look at Israel. Look what's going on in the Mideast. Look what's going on in the world. Look through. More importantly, look what's going on in the church. And I'll tell you, be on the alert. Right, I said that the rapture and the tribulation are intimately tied together. All right? Because the rapture is God taking us away in the final days. But I will tell you, have you heard the words pre, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-tribulation, post-trib? Those three things describe what most Christians who believe in the tribulation and the rapture, believe in the word of God, are divided upon as to what point God would have this rapture take place. This rapture of the tribulation is seven years, the completion of time. Seven years. You know what tribulation is, right? Bad stuff. Right? So is the rapture going to take place? Will God remove us before that seven-year period starts? That, that's what's called pre-trib. That, seven, that seven-year period is scripturally broken into two parts. Right? There are many places in scripture where it talks about this three and a half years and three and a half years. So there is a midpoint in the tribulation. And a lot of people believe that the, the rapture would take place at that point before it gets really, I mean, the, the final. And there are people who believe that Christians will go through the entire seven years and then the rapture takes place. That's the post. The one thing that you have to understand is please never get into an argument or great debate with anybody about this. And the reason for that is that Listen to this verse. You've heard me say this verse here a lot of times. From Peter writing this, 2 Peter 1.3. He said, for we, he's, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. The word of God. God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. And I've said this before too. Often what God has not said or not given us is as important as what he has. Because if he did not tell us specifically that it's going to happen before, in the middle, or at the end of the tribulation, obviously, it doesn't pertain to either life or godliness. But he also says in Matthew, but pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. So what's your point? So that means, I mean, that to me sounds like that's the, you're in the tribulation. You're going to be in that. I mean, the rapture is going to pull in the tribulation. And here's an example of what I was just talking Not about. Not to do. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the reason being, no, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you and tell you, I very strongly believe 
that the rapture will take place, and that rapture will be at the midpoint. That's I, I, If you're going to classify as pre, mid, or post, I'm a mid guy. However, I don't argue the point. It doesn't matter. Because for one thing, that's exactly the answer. It doesn't matter. This is like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Exactly. If you know the story in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. when he was in Babylon, when they were in Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar had erected a statue and he told everybody to bow down and worship it. And these three young men who had been brought as captives from, from Israel were told either bow down or you, you're going to die. And they refused. They, they would not bow down. So Nebuchadnezzar says, if you don't bow down, we're going to throw you into a furnace. This is not an easy death. And when they continue to refuse, he tells his servants, eat this furnace up seven times hotter. Now, at that point, they, they declare that they don't know whether God is going to deliver them from this furnace or through the furnace. But they said, regardless, he's God. That's my attitude. That's the culprit. It doesn't matter. Yes, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I have a, I have a preference. I mean, I, I prefer, hey, you know. Prefer uh, mid-trib. Yeah, send, send the bus, <laughs> pick me up, and say, hey, let's go, yeah. But I, don't, I trust in God. I trust in God and his love for me. That he knows. And there is an appointed time for everything. All right. So regardless, because they were thrown into the furnace. They did not escape that tribulation of the furnace. However, having been thrown into a furnace that had been heated up seven times hotter, the three of them were thrown in and four of them marched around. Because Jesus Christ showed up. To be with him. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And they came through that fire. The flames didn't touch him. Even the smoke didn't touch them. They came out not smelling a soap. But the, but the one who had thrown them in the fire was devoured by the fire. So here's what I do know. Because it says in, in, in the Psalms, many of the afflictions of the righteous. God does not promise that we will not face trials, tribulations, and afflictions. What he does promise is that we will be able to say, like the Apostle Paul did at the end of the day, that I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. And my peace comes, not from what happens here on this little blue planet, my peace comes from this fact. Jesus Christ said, did you hear this before? Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not have told you. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body. You know, if, if this troubles you, let's get together. Let's say, here, I, I can set an alarm on my iPhone. Let's set an alarm, alarm for like 100, 150 years from now. And we'll get together and discuss this. Because you want to know, at that point, what's it going to matter? We, it's kind of neat. And I, I think this is the truth. It's my experience, but I think it's a, a general truth. I, I still have a fairly good memory. I can remember a lot of things. I've been through some things in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some experiences in the service. I had polio when I was a kid. I've been hit by a... Uh, I've been on a plane that exploded. I've been hit by a truck. Hurricane uh, at sea. I've been in a hurricane at sea. But like when I was hit by a truck, you know, we, just before the Bible study started, we were talking a little bit about pain. Uh, uh, and the fact is, I said to Alice, I, won't, I never lost consciousness. I got hit by a speeding semi-truck. And I'm laying for two hours by the side of a road in Central America. And the pain was so incredible that I said to Alice while we were waiting for an ambulance, that this little British glory that took two hours to get to me, I said, I can't imagine, I can't believe that you can have this much pain and stay conscious, not pass out. I mean, I can't, I can't describe the pain. Having said that, I can remember that it hurt, but I can't remember the pain. You know, once you're past it, you're past it. Mm -hmm. um, I, here's, what I, here's what I know. With God, I can do anything. And there is nothing that I can go through that he will not give me the grace to go through, the strength to go through. I don't have to rely on my own ability. I don't have to rely on my own willpower. I don't have to rely on my own anything because he will be there. He will show up 
and he will make a way even if there is no way. So don't get into debates about when this rapture is going to take place. Be prepared. Because even you know you, you can figure, okay, well, I'm gonna you can go tonight. You have no guarantee of when you're gonna go. There's an appointed time. And as there is an appointed time for this coming of Jesus to catch away his his children, his brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and even he doesn't know that. You want to know there is an appointed time. I have so many God determines our our times and the boundaries of our habitation. It says in the book of Acts. Yes. I don't know what my times are. I, quite frankly, when I got saved, I didn't think I'd make it this long. Mm. I, you know, I, I didn't. And I have no idea how much longer God has destined my life on this planet to last. Mm -hmm. So what? What do I care? I'm going to be here as long as he wants me to be here. So I've had people try to kill me. I've had hospitals try and kill me after that accident. You know what? If God says you're not, it's not your time, it's not going to be my time. And if God says that it is my time, all the king's horses and all the king's men ain't going to put this Humpty Dumpty back together. But God is in control. That's what we talked about last week. He's in control of the situation. The devil is not in control of my life. Hallelujah. That dummy. I can say that damn dummy. Because he is. I can judge him. He has no power over my life. He's been disarmed. God has given me authority over him. He has no authority over me. God is in control of this yes. situation. God is in control of my life. Yes. I will be here till the moment that the Lord says it's time for me to go. And not, not nothing Second on this second. earth can change that fact. Hallelujah. So, we don't know when it's going to happen. I, like I said, I have reason, and actually most of my reason comes from Paul's writings in 2 Thessalonians and in his second letter to Timothy, why I believe that, that, that there will be a rapture that takes place in the middle of this. But again, it doesn't, it's, not a, it's not a big issue. If it were a big issue, God would have made it clear yeah. in the Word. Right. Right? So don't get off on tangents with people and, and wrangle about words. This is what Paul says. Don't wrangle about words. Don't get diverted. Don't get distracted from God's purpose in your life by getting involved in great debates. We're not supposed to win debates. We're supposed to win souls. God said he wouldn't give us more than we could bear. Absolutely. We endure. So he knows how much we can endure. And we're here to that time. Okay. Like that one guy, he, did, uh, he kept on putting store up food and stuff like this. Right. Storage. Yeah. Storage. Storage. Yeah. But didn't want to give it to the people. And, and then the Lord says, before the night's over, with you're going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Your time's up. And you should have gave it to the people. That's right. So, you know, this is, this, there's so much. I mean, we could spend, and we, we're not going to do that, because I have a tendency to want to do that. Let's go off and do the Sermon on the Mount again. Mm -hmm. But this is why Jesus said, don't be anxious for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Be anxious for nothing. Tomorrow has enough concerns of its own, you know. Just just live your life today. Trust him. Yeah. And I, I, my life is not guided uh, by the Mayans. You know, I actually spent time studying the Mayans because we lived in, in a Mayan area in Central America. Uh, I actually did some work for the government of, of Belize in Central America that had to do with the tourism trade. Uh, and they had this Rauta Maya that was part of a joint project between Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. And... Uh, so, you know, you hear a lot of talk today about the Mayan calendar ends in 2012, which indeed it does. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they had some kind of flash of spiritual insight that we don't have. Could the world end in 20? Of course it could. Sure. And you know what? That's fine by me. This could happen at any moment, given what's taking place in the Middle East. I mean, we, we live in a time when there have to be prophecies, certain prophecies that are fulfilled before the end can come. To the best of my knowledge, I mean, most of those prophecies are either fulfilled or they, the potential for them to be fulfilled is right there, right now, which is unique to our generation. That didn't exist. You know, I was just thinking, it's like, like one prophecy, there's still prophecies, prophecies that have to be fulfilled. But it's like the domino thing. 
there could be just one prophecy that would make all the rest that are following. Well, so, there, there is one happens. specific prophecy. I mean, there are a lot of things that, that kind of say, all right, this, is, this has to happen before the end. Can you do me a favor and take that? This is live and in color. Okay. Uh, there, there are a lot of prophecies that have to happen before the end of time. For sure. There are a lot of things that have yet to be fulfilled. However, there is specifically one prophecy in Scripture that says when this happens, that's the end. Period. And, and we can have an effect on this. Well, I was just going to say that. Because that one, one prophecy is that Jesus said this gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ has to be preached to all creation, all you know, all nations, and then the end will come. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, we've been blessed here at Bible Talk to be able to go out and, and travel a lot of the world. I mean, I've preached the gospel on five continents, um, but I am, I surely haven't reached every place. I, you know, I mean, I've been to less places than there are. So. Not a good way to you haven't it. been to every place. No, I've far from been to every place, but I've been to a lot of places. But we're broadcasting right now, and we're broadcasting on the Internet. And the fact of the matter is that there are very few places in the world where this Internet does not reach. Right? And even places that the Internet does not reach. I mean, we've been out in the bush, out in the jungle in, in Africa. Um, as a matter of fact, Mark was with us in West Africa. When we went out into the uh, deep into the bush to go and take the gospel out to pygmies, um, now they don't have the internet out there. I promise you, they don't have the internet. But you know what? They're being reached by people nearby who do have the internet. That's a fact too. Um, this technology is changing things in the world. There are there are the United Nations in conjunction, and I'm not. Well, I won't go there. The United Nation, in conjunction with people like the, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with some corporations, they have made it a project to try and bring the Internet and computer power out into the most desolate places because it's great for education, right? So maybe the gospel hasn't reached all of the, right. the nations, but boy, it's got to be sure close to them. It, it really does. That's the one prophecy that says, when this happens, it's over. So now, if you are a Christian who says, even so come Lord Jesus. If you're a Christian who says, well, I want the Lord to return. If you're a Christian who's looking forward to that great promise of going to that place that is better than here, go tell somebody about Jesus. Share the gospel. I mean, you know, there's going to be one last person who hears the gospel. You know, that just reminded me of just, um, I think a couple of months ago, we were up in New York with Bob and Pam, and we had stopped at the Dunkin' Donuts. And Bob, at the end, when we were getting ready to leave, Bob said to the cashier, the young young fellow there, and I think he was from India or somewhere, some other country. Yeah. And he said to him, did anyone ever tell you, to, did anyone tell you today that Jesus loved you, loves you? And he said that the young man just looked at him and he said, no one has ever told me that. So there are people here. You don't oh, have absolutely. to go into the, you know, into out into the boomies and the. Absolutely, absolutely. There are people here yeah. that haven't heard that yet. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, we we have made that a practice in our lives for a long time. And it's typically, you know, we'll go in wherever we are, grocery stores or whatever, mm -hmm. and just say to people, you know, has anybody told you today that Jesus loves you? And we did that the other day, and uh, we stopped in a Walgreens drugstore to pick up some oh, yes, green tea, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And as we were checking out, I asked the young lady uh, behind the counter, that's what I said to her. I said, you know, you mind if I ask you a question? She said, no. I said, has anybody today told you that Jesus loves you? Well, more often than not, that's just, a, you know, somebody will say something and, and we're off. Well, we wound up spending 15 minutes at that counter mm -hmm. in conversation with her. Because nobody had told her that Jesus loved her. Mm -hmm. And she was desperate to find out what that meant. Mm -hmm. She was she was hungry to hear about this God who loves her mm -hmm. and the depth of his love. Mm -hmm. So there are people here in this country That's right. who need to hear about Jesus. You, if you know about Jesus, are in a position to tell them. That's right. Now you don't have to go to Bible school. 
You don't have to be ordained. You don't have to stand behind the pulpit. If you know that Jesus loves you and that he has rescued you from the wrath to come, that's what you can share. That's right. Because you want to know something? He's no respecter of persons. He loves me. He loves you. He died on that cross for all the world. And he looked out across the world in time and said, Father, forgive them. Go share the love of Jesus Christ with somebody. All right. I, I've really been eager to get into the fifth chapter here. Okay? So. Biting at the bit here? Yeah, well, so let's get into the fifth chapter. Zooming along. I'm going to read the first two verses, all right? Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So now he's talked to them about this. And now he said, well, you don't, you don't need to hear about this, right? Why don't they need to know? I'll tell you. Because Jesus said, going back to Matthew 24, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Right? In Revelation, Jesus says, in the 16th chapter, 15th verse, he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.10, what we were talking about, he said, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. What I'm trying to say here is, Jesus taught these things to his disciples. His disciples passed them on. They didn't, you know, Paul, a lot of unsaved people, unfortunately, even some saved people, believe that Paul kind of made stuff up and created this. He did not. These are people that passed along what they had received. We did a, a Bible bite some time ago about echoes. Yes. And so just a few months ago, you can go look it up on Bible-bites.com or on the Bible Talk website. And there's one there that talks about echoes. And the fact that we're supposed to resound the word of God. Resounding means to resound it. That's like an echo. Yes. To repeat what you have heard. Peter is repeating what he heard from Jesus. Paul is repeating what he has heard from the Spirit of God. They're not making this stuff up. So he has an assurance that they have heard this already. Because Jesus had spoken it. And it had been carried forth. That was, this is the function of the body of Christ. It is the function of people in the body of Christ that the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, right? Yes. Is to equip the saints for the work of service. What do you equip the saints with? The word of God. So he had this assurance that they had heard it, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I want to get into this. This is where we're, we're going to make sure we're set up for Next week, which will probably, or I make no guarantee, be the conclusion of our study in First Thessalonians. All right? yeah. So let me just read further, right? We have no need because they've, they've had anything written because they've heard it. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety. Right? Mm -hmm. This is all going to happen when people are saying peace and safety. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not night or dark or of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do this sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate plate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not death must be getting late. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait to stop there a second. Remember I said this in the first chapter, chapter one, verse ten. He talked about that we are being saved by Jesus Christ from the wrath to come. Mm -hmm. Here, as he ends up the letter, we get to the end of the letter, he is saying that the purpose of this is 
that we are not destined for wrath, but obtaining salvation. This is all about, a lot of people, you know, you wonder why is the gospel? Well, you can turn on some Christian preachers and you think, well, the, the reason for the gospel is so that you can get richer. The reason for the gospel is so you can get healthier. The reason for the gospel is so you can drive a better car, live in a better house. That's not what the gospel is about. The message of the gospel is about you being saved from the day of wrath, being saved. Your salvation from Jesus Christ is to be saved from the destruction that you did deserve. As a result of your sin. Because we are all sinners. And all fall short of the glory of God. Alright. The wages of sin is death. You sinned. I sinned. We yes. all sinned. The only one that ever lived without sin. Is Jesus Christ. Which is why he and he alone. Could redeem man from the curse of sin. The unblemished life. Because he who knew no sin. Became sin for our sake. So the point of all this is. That we are being redeemed and saved from the destruction that God will pour out as a consequence of sin. That's the reason for the gospel. That doesn't mean that God won't bless you. It doesn't mean that there are not other things. But it's why Jesus Christ could say. There are side benefits. There, right? there, there, there are side benefits. There are side effects to this walking mm -hmm. in Christianity. But this is why Jesus Christ could talk about this. And say this is the focus. When the apostles were sent out. And they came back and they were rejoicing. And they were really excited because they had seen the power of God and they had been given authority by Jesus. They went out, they preached the gospel, they healed the sick, they cast out demons and they came back. And Jesus said, hey, calm down. I'm paraphrasing. Don't rejoice over that. He said, rejoice over this. Your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. At the end of the day, all of this is about one thing and one thing only eternity in heaven in the presence of God. Not, not having a better life here. Maybe you'll get a better life. Right? That's what I said. Jesus Christ said, don't, don't focus on that. He said, what you're supposed to focus on? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest will be added unto you. He'll decide about that. Yeah. Right, but that's what it's about. You know, too much of the church is getting distracted because we're trying to make the church pretty and attractive to men. And, you know, attractive to men without touching their spirit. We want to make, you know, we want to tell them, if you become a Christian, you'll get a better job. If you get a, become a Christian, you'll get a better house. You'll get a, you know, maybe you will. But that's not what it's about, and that's not the purpose. It's just like the WWJD, and I tell people it's actually more Stanford. They say, yeah, what you got to do is this. No, we already know what we've got to do. I want to walk with Jesus daily. That way, he keeps me safe. And and absolutely. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons that the church, I, I think one of the, the great problems, one of the great errors in the church right now is the fact that the church, and I'm just a broad brush, all right? We're trying to make the Lord attractive to men. We're trying to make Christianity attractive. Men. You're trying to make the cross attractive. Well, no, I mean, that, that, no, 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 no. That's that's why they evade the cross they because there the is cross. no way to make the cross attractive yeah. to men. Yeah. And you, you can make thing. you know you can you can say that the great celebration is Christmas, which is we're in the, that time of year right now, mm -hmm. or and Easter. make it all pretty songs and pretty decorations. But the fact of the matter is, in spite of what you may say, in spite of what you may think, that's not what draws men to Jesus Christ. He said, "If I be lifted up." I will draw all men unto me. He was lifted up on the cross. Isaiah 53 said he had no appearance that men should be attracted to him. Until you are willing, like Paul, to preach Christ and him crucified, when people, it is the horror of the cross that attracts the spirit of man. You can't change that. You can't pretty it up. You can't make it different. Christ and him crucified, the horror of that cross, is the most beautiful, most glorious thing that ever happened. Because it was there on that cross that my sins were taken away and I was restored to God the Father. Hallelujah. And Father, I can't begin to tell you how thankful we are that you sent your son to do that for us in the fullness of time. That he would come and willingly go to that cross to take my place to pay the price for my sin. 
that I might have eternal life with you, that I could go to that place that he is preparing, that I could have that peace knowing that I have been delivered from the wrath to come. Whether I go through the tribulation or escape the tribulation, I have already escaped the wrath to come because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Well, until next time, and I think we may finish our study in 1 Thessalonians next week. God bless you and bye bye. Your word is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.